Welcome to the AP Physics 1 video lecture. This is on gravity. This is Newton's Law of Universal Gravitation, Part 1. To talk about this section, you have to understand what a vector field is. So we know a basic vector from previous units as to have a strength and a direction. The strength of it is determined by how long something is. So this is referred to the strength. So this is a long strength. We say this is a, this is weaker because it's smaller and this is weak, right? Because it's a, then the arrow will give you the direction, right? Normally we have one arrow to tell us the strength and the direction. But a vector field is when you have a bunch of vectors in a direction and in a magnitude. How you are going to use this is to look at certain areas like say here. You say this, you could say this vector field here is going this direction, right? Because all those vectors are pointing that way, okay? Then you could say right right here, all the vector fields here are going up, right? But if you look at it overall, you would see that the vector field here is circulating or diverging to this point right here. So here you would say that all the vector fields, all the vectors are con converging at a singular point. You're going to see this in um, weather where you can take a look. Here, this is the uh, wind fronts that are converging here at the Gulf of Mexico. Okay. And which is going to probably cause a hurricane of some sort. So you could look at the different vector fields. Vector fields can show you the direction of magnitude at a certain location in that vector field. So here you see that it's all going this way. Here you could see that it is going just this way. But if you look at it overall, you could see it's all converging to this point. So a vector field helps you describe where things will move. You're going to use that. Vector fields are most useful to describe interaction between long range forces. The vector fields can also describe and predict the interaction between objects. For example, if you put a boat here, if you put a boat right here, you could say that it will go this way. If you put a boat here, you would say it would go upwards, right? Based on the arrow, it's going to tell you where the object would move. The two different types of fields that we're going to work with, which are long range forces, is your gravitational field and your electric field. The gravity field. We will see that anywhere on Earth, whether you are in Alaska, Peru, or Australia, you see that the force of gravity acts towards the center of the earth. You can say that the gravitational force is always attractive towards the direction of the center of mass. Here's the center of mass, CM. So let's take a look at the vector field of gravity that is on earth. You would see that the strength of the vector field gets stronger as you approaches the center of mass of earth. Now let's introduce Mars. Mars has its own gravitational field. So at every single dot, I draw a red arrow pointing towards Mars. Now we have the vector field, which is blue, that describes the gravitational field on Earth. Then we have red, which is the gravitational field that exists in for Mars. If we have two different vectors, we can add them. We do a vector addition. So you add it from um, 
tail one tail to the new head and as a result you can get the vector sum so the green is a result of adding those two vectors and the two vectors you sh that you add is the vector the gravitational field vectors and the red which is the gravitational field vector for Mars together you get the green and this is what it looks like you should notice that here if you are an object right here you would go towards Earth but if you are an object right here you would go towards Mars based on what is pulling you in terms of the gravitational field the green arrows here represent the gravitational field in space where you have Earth and Mars. Notice if the object is here, if you put an object here like a comet, you do not know if it's either going to go to Mars or it's going to go to Earth. You don't know. All you know that it's, it's just going to be pointing that direction. You do not know whether it's going to go towards Mars or Earth. But at other spots, like here, you see that it's already pointing towards Earth. Okay? That is the usefulness of looking at the vector fields. Next, we can look at the force of gravity that exists. So we saw that if we put an object in Earth's gravitational field, there is a gravitational force that is exerted on the moon by the Earth. And also, due to Newton's third law, there's an equal and opposite force. So there's also a gravitational force that is exerted on Earth by the moon. And it looks something like this if you want to see just it in vectors. In addition to the three laws of motion, Sir Isaac Newton also uh, derived a way to calculate the force of gravity for celestial bodies. That's large planetary masses. You have Fg is equal to big G, that big G is called the law of universal gravitational. It's just a mathematical constant. Big mass M, here is going to be the mass of the Earth, and little m, which is the smaller mass, divided by the radius squared. And the radius goes from the center of the big mass to the center of the small mass. We can see the interaction between the force of gravity and the gravitational field. Fg equals to mg is the force of gravity. Fg equals to gm m over r squared would be the force of gravity as well. You used to see that the gravitational force here equals the other gravitational force. It's the same thing. The two masses cancel here. Okay, I will come back to these. Technically, these are different masses, if you really think about it. This is your inertia, inertia mass. And this is your gravitational mass. Okay? And for the sake of this explanation, those two can cancel out. They are th experimentally the same. You could see that G is equal to the gravity, uh, that G is equal to that big G gravitational constant, big mass over R squared. You could say that the little, the little G stands for the gravitational field, which is the acceleration of gravity, which is also the centripetal acceleration of a planet that exists in circular motion. So A is equal to G, big M over R squared. The reason why this is useful is that we can actually calculate the G that exists on Earth. So G is equal to gravitational constant G mass over R squared. That little g here is the gravitational field, i.e. the acceleration of gravity. You're going to find the gravitational field, i.e. gravitational acceleration, on the Earth's surface. The mass of the Earth is roughly 6 times 10 to the 24 kilograms. We know that that big G is that universal gravitational constant. And the distance from the Earth's center, which is right here, 
to the Earth's surface right here is R is equal to 6.38 times 10 to the 6 meters. If you plug it into your equation, you should get G equals to 9.8 meters per second squared. You should see this. This is the G that we use for an object falling in free fall. This is the gra because the object is experiencing the 9.8 meters per second from the gravitational field. We saw that on the Earth's surface, it behaves as 9.8. And we notice as you go above the surface, so this is if you go above the surface more and more and more and more and more, so this increases, you would see that the value of G here dramatically dramatically decreases. If we graph this, you should take a look. It behaves this way. This, the way you see it decay down, it's called the inverse square law. Whether, whatever happens to the distance, the inverse square law happens to the strength of the gravitational field and the force of gravity. For example, if the distance doubles, what happens to gravity? That's R. The inverse of doubling is one half. The square of one half is one fourth. Therefore, if the distance from the mass doubles, the strength of gravity becomes one fourth as well. We could take a look here in the calculation. The original force is one over R squared. The radius is doubled. Then you see a one fourth there. Okay, that's the new force. This is called the inverse square law. Now, I want you to take a look between the gravitational field and the gravitational force. So we should know that the gravitational field is this G. This equation helps um, us can be solved for the surface gravity by simply putting in the radius and R. Next is the gravitational force. The gravitational force behaves this between two masses and they're basically planetary objects. Here are some example AP1 physics questions on this topic. A moon of mass 1 times 10 to the 20 kilogram is in circular motion around a planet. The planet exerts a gravitational force of 2 times 10 to the 21 newtons on the moon. The centripetal acceleration of the moon is nearly what? So the answer here is C, 20 meters per second squared. How do we get this? We should see that the force of gravity is equal to mg. Solving for g, you divide m, m to the other side. If you're wondering how I got this, is, is the force of gravity is pulling the mass down right, at mg. That's it. Okay, so you can just plug in the force of gravity and the um, mass and you should see that the G here is 20 meters per second squared. So on this planet, the fact that the gravitational force is 2 times 10 to the 21 on the moon, you could see that the acceleration is 20 meters per second. This is a lot. That's like slightly over double what we have on Earth. Next, here a 2 kilogram object is a distance 10 million meters away from the center of Earth, which has a mass of nearly 6 times 10 to the 24 kilograms. What is the approximate gravitational field strength of Earth gravitational field at the location of the 10 kilogram object? Give this a try. Here's the hint. Those, the 2 kilograms and the 10 kilograms doesn't do anything here. You're still going to set up the same equation. Fg, the force of gravity, is equal to gravitational constant m1, m2 over r squared. You should see that this here can be m2g equals to this. You should see why the m2s will cancel. All you have left is the gravitational acceleration. 
which is g is equal to the gravitational constant which is big g the new mass one we have that as your um, 6 times 10 to the 24 then divide it by the radius squared that is how you get the answer of 4 newtons over kilograms lastly a satellite of 1,000 kilogram is in circular orbit around a planet. The centripetal acceleration of the satellite is about 5 meters per second squared. What is the gravitational force? You should see that the answer is 5,000 newtons. How do we get that? Please understand that the centripetal acceleration of this planet is due to the centripetal force due to the gravity that the planet exerts on the satellite. The centripetal acceleration of the object also represents the strength of the gravitational field at the satellite's location. So here, here, the planet is exerting a force downwards, and the earth, and that that we are seeing is your mg. Okay, that's what we have here. That is the centripetal force. It is supplied by the mg here. Plug in the m, which is 1,000. The g is 5. And you get 5,000 newtons. This is the, the force of gravity. That the, that's the gravitational force that you feel exerted on the satellite by the planet. So here, your this planet is feeling a 5,000 newton force inwards, always. But the reason why it keeps going around in a circle is because of the tangential velocity. All right, there you go. This is the law of universal gravitation, part one.